Yle Areena. What's life like in Turku? We travel to the city to find out. Hello and welcome to All Points North, the podcast that tries to reach all regions of Finland and beyond. I'm Egan Richardson. And I'm Zina Ayavino. Now, Egan, we do try to reach all areas of Finland, but this week we're focusing on the southwest and especially the former capital city of Turku. You spent a whole working week there looking at newcomers arriving in the city. How did it go? It, it was a fascinating week. Uh, first and foremost, it was great to spend a longer period in Turku, which is the oldest city in Finland, I think. Um, it'll be 800 years old in 2029, which many people there were keen to remind me. Um, the city says it wants to be carbon neutral by 2029 to coincide with that milestone. And you have to say it's not a city that struggles to sing its own praises by Finnish standards. Varför Paris, vi har ju Åbo. Or, why Paris when we've got Turku? Isn't that the city's official slogan? It's something like that, yeah. I mean, why Paris, we we, we do have Turku. Um, as I was leaving, actually, I asked one co- colleague to get in touch if he's ever in the Helsinki office. And he just looked at me, deadpan, and said, why would I go to Helsinki? Uh, but yes, uh, that is all ironic. And underneath it all, people are extremely welcoming. I had a great time there. Um, I was there to focus on foreigners in the city and especially those who recently moved. They are a crucial part of the city's future, according to the director of research down there, Timo Aro. He says that four out of five municipalities in Finland are set to shrink in the next 15 years. And Turku is one of those few that is expected to grow. And there are, of course, going to be many more older people in Turku and many more foreign language speakers. Well, when it comes to foreign language speakers, that's our audience. So what did you find out about them? I met quite a few. And of course, I asked them how they'd been welcomed to the city. I wanted to know what happens when people move to Turku from abroad and how they settled into their new home, especially professionally. Uh, I guess, first of all, we could hear from the mayor, Minna Arve, for the official version about how the city feels international. She said that the history of the city is extremely global and that it wanted to project an international image. So, I mean, the international way of thinking and and this kind of uh, atmosphere has been here always. And I think that's why it's been so natural that now the modern times when the uh, communities, uh, foreign communities have moved to Finland, they have found their places here. And when you have a small community, it always gets bigger because that's where people gather around someone they know or their their culture or their families or whatever. And that's what's been for very important for me as a mayor to state also in our strategies, now as a, in our mayoral program, that Turku is an open and international city which is welcoming all to be residents of Turku. And be, if, they, if they choose Turku as their home city, so this is where they belong. And I think that's very important. Is, is there any resistance to that within the city, within the council? Mm. Yes and no. <laughs> of course, we have diverse uh, discussion as as in Finland, and we have uh, political parties who are um, kind of uh, having more agenda to criticism towards immigration. And, and I think that's also a good way to... T- Well, as long as we are discussing about the structures. But then I don't accept that, that if we are talking about people, because that's a different thing, because uh, structures is something what we decide on, and, and those could be, uh, those are political decisions, and those could be criticized as well. And of course, if people are doing something which is uh, illegal or is not according to our norms and standards, regardless where they are from, originally Finns or, or foreign languages or foreign countries, uh, so they should be criticized what they're doing, not because what how they are based here. And uh, so every, same rules for everyone. I, uh, I think that's that's a kind of good place. But on the same time, all and each party in, in Turku has agreed our mayoral program. 
all on each party and member even all members in our city council have agreed um, agreement against racism uh, in this city and uh, that states that we are actively working also against racism and uh, and working for equality and uh, kind of uh, open city mentality and atmosphere. So as you heard there, the city wants to project a positive image to people outside Finland. But even the mayor does refer to a certain tension between the city's desire to be a melting pot and certain strands of opinion within it. Egan, you said earlier that you were looking at how people had settled in. So how are they settling in? Well, as you know, there are often teething problems when people move to Finland. People often feel underemployed, they don't get the kind of roles they would hope for or that they trained for. And I did meet people who have faced that problem. One of them was Richie Virasami, who lives in Nantali. He is married to a Finn and has been visiting Finland for decades. He decided to move here for family reasons primarily, but he was looking forward to spending more time in the forests and with his three kids and indulging his passion for marathon running. Now, Richie's an experienced chef. He's worked at Downing Street and he's run his own restaurants in West Cork in Ireland. He was even a TV chef uh, for a time in Ireland, starring in several series. Um, He eventually found work on the ferries to Sweden when he moved to Finland and he's also started several companies as an entrepreneur. But it has been a real struggle. I went to meet him at Turku's Market Hall, which is basically his home habitat. Now, he's a foodie, so he knew almost everyone there and was constantly greeting people and telling me about restaurants and shops I should try. Now, I should say that I did eat very well in Turku. It's a great gastronomic experience. Um, But here's Richie on his introduction to Finland. To bring all that knowledge and to come here, having been coming here for 26 years on holiday, and then to move here and constantly get like 122 rejections, for CVs and not even replied back. I um, only had four, I think, four, four responses uh, out of 126, and the responses were something like too experienced and overqualified. I was like, what is going on? This is crazy. I thought we'd just, you know, close up shop six weeks before COVID, sell up, emigrate to Finland, and get a job. And then when you start reaching out, I, I work with the Irish Embassy, and you kind of reach out with other Irish people living in Finland and British people living in Finland, they will tell you the same the same experience. The very same experience exists amongst all of us. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It's stopped at the border and you have to shred off that skin and that's how they expect it. Yeah, and if either you conform to that or you don't, and if you don't conform to it, you find it very challenging. Mm-hmm. Or you become an entrepreneur and do your own thing. And, and thankfully, I have the skill sets to do that and have created a private dining company here locally. Uh, I import Irish beef and Irish seafood from uh, Ireland to Finland. And then we have a staff agency in four offices around Latvia, Dublin, here, and Helsinki that we interview all Scandinavian staff from all regions of Scandinavia and we send them to Ireland because we're short 250 thousand hospitality workers and Mm. chefs. We hear similar stories pretty often, but that is an extreme example. Yes, it was amazing to hear. And it's absolutely fascinating that Richie is now working to take foreign workers to Ireland rather than Finland, where he lives and where there is a labour shortage. But it speaks to the rather extreme difficulties people have in finding the right opportunities. Now, we've used Richie's clip here because it illustrates so well the issues many other people face, and so many other people told me about last week. They're underemployed, they don't get chances, they feel underappreciated, and they're just poorer than they might be if they got the chances that they like. We've covered discrimination in the labour market quite often, and it seems like that might be playing a role here. One story that still gets mentioned a lot was a study on job applications a few years ago. Researchers found that a woman with a white-sounding Finnish name got more than five times the number of interviews than a man with a Somali name. So Richie's roots might be working against him here. Indeed, and it's something he's aware of. When I got here, my wife's friend, my wife's Finnish, from Kultanita, 
Paul and Reards, Generation Z, they all said you should change your surname to a Finnish surname. Rico Virtanen, they called me. <laughs> right? Rico. Rico Virtanen. Yeah. So, so, um, so I have a nickname of Rico Virtanen. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not changing my surname. Yeah. And they were like, um, well, you might find it difficult when you're seeing it. And they were right. But I don't want to work for a company with those values. Yeah. Right. If I, if if they have those values from day one, mm. they're not they're not fit for me anyway. Right. That's not that's not that's not a good fit for me to go and work for a company like that. Mm. So that existed and happened. And you know there are companies here I've applied two or three times for. So this is something I heard again and again. Uh, there were people who started their own businesses as they did not get employment. There were stories about people who left the country. But people like Richie are incredibly resourceful and they will eventually find a way. He's now juggling several companies and doing shifts on the ferries and he's keeping himself very busy indeed. But not everyone has his background or energy. What about people arriving now? Are they getting the help they need? That is a key question and the answer, of course, isn't the same for everyone. Uh, some people arrive and they get straight into everyday life and they have a new career. Others can take a while to get used to the country and to find the networks they need. In Turku, they've been offering a service to new arrivals since 2021. It's called the Soft Landing Programme and it aims to greet people with a friendly face and advice on where to go and how to get practical matters sorted. And also how to resume your career in a new place. Jonathan Murphy is one of the advisors at International House Turku and he told me a little about what they do. But we would like to be a facilitation point, I think, to introduce internationals to the city and introduce them to services and other stakeholders, whether it's kind of universities or companies or NGOs or just other city services, maybe make them aware of the full range of potential that the city has for them. I think so often, and I remember this when I was new in Turku, you kind of drop in and you're not sure where to start, you don't know what's available to you, maybe you've seen a poster at the library, maybe you've seen something on Facebook and you're like, okay, can I go to that? Who's this for? Is it for me? I don't want to bother people. And I think what we're offering as a kind of basic level is, okay, come to us, have a coffee, come and sit down, let's talk about your situation. Are you someone who's working here but you don't have any hobbies or friends? Are you someone who's studying here and you want to stay afterwards? Are you, like I was, a spouse and your wife has got a job here and you've quit your career in the UK and you're having an existential crisis <laughs> about what you want to do next? So we can kind of be a good starting point for that and we can think of a plan, we can introduce you to other services, we can introduce you to other networks that we think will make things easier for you. That was Jonathan Murphy there from International House Turku. I should mention that his organisation offers lots of informal meetups and coffee mornings. And if you've just moved to Turku, it is a really good place to go and find out what they're up to if you're interested in hearing from people in a similar position to you. They do actually have a Peace Pispirientai event where you can taste the local iced donut speciality. Pardon me? Yeah, so iced donuts are known as Berlini monkey in most of Finland, but in Turku they call them Pispan monkey, or Pispis monkey for short. So this event is a little bit of local pride for the newcomers. And I mean, who doesn't like free donuts? Um, they're based at Monitori in the city centre, so if you want advice, help or free donuts, just pop in. We know networks are important, but so are jobs. What advice did people have on that front? Right. Uh, we know that people tend to feel more settled once they have a job, if they're not stay-at-home parents, for example, or have something else to do. But that can often be the most difficult part of the puzzle. One issue is that a lot of people move to Finland and have the kind of education that tends to lead to office work, so business degrees, social science degrees and the like. And the problem there is that many employers seem to demand Finnish language skills for those kinds of roles. I met Tim Linker, a German who moved to Finland to get a social science degree and now works in manufacturing. His career path was a little unusual. I, uh, I got a social science degree from Germany and I was in exchange in, in Turku and I met my future wife and I came back for a master's degree then in Tampere and uh, after that I mean, we had a 
first kid was on the way and there was not terribly much time to go do a couple more internships because we need money, I started working in the service sector and then from there I kind of worked myself through various jobs and realized I'm very good with machines. And from there then I actually like moved from a bunch of factories to the next and I'm now happily employed in that sector which was very unexpected but actually really grew to like it and it's, there's a lot of uh, good jobs also in that sector that maybe for many people would be worth considering and there's a growing shortage of in that field. It sounds like he's found a place he's happy with. He really has. He said that there are big regional differences within Finland and the labour market outside Helsinki might require a different approach. Here's Tim again. Then, for example, in south of Finland, where I live, and you are a high university educated person with a particular degree, let's say it's marketing, let's say it's business or or anything like that, then it's very hard to find a job in Turku compared to Helsinki or maybe even Tampere these days. Why I hear it's much easier. And then again, if you're in IT, it basically doesn't matter, you know, like but the language is already English and you just fall into that world and you can stay out and I know people have been for 10 years they don't speak any Finnish because they just get hired out of university because IT is IT and the short labor shortage has been there there forever basically and but then when you are for example not when you have a completely different background when you are like a blue collar worker or you're willing let's say to to also do menial works then you have very easy like comparably easy time to find a job here in the region Maybe compared to other re- regions, again, I'm not sure how the difference is there. But, like, but when you, you see, we see this also like in the more, on the more coastal, western coastal areas in Bohemia, Ostrobotnia, and those regions where there is a lot of foreign labor, which they do find a lot of work because they often the language requirements are different, the barriers of entry are much lower. And in general, where there's a lot of industry, the air barriers of entry are very different because these days machines are so good that you can basically train people very quickly with certain machines. I've seen this firsthand in car factories and battery factories that you get people in and within a week or so they know most of what they should do and then it's just a question of getting to do it at the right pace and at the right quality. And so so in that field it's comparably easy. They're still probably depending on your own background, uh, where you're coming from, still much the barriers can vary a lot. There's definitely groups that experience more discrimination than others, but broadly speaking, that category is much easier than when you are a highly educated person and you come here and you maybe have have gotten your degree here and it's all in English. And then you finish and then comes the reality of the labor market where despite a lot of talk, English is not enough in most areas outside of IT. Things are indeed different if you're in IT, but there are plenty of opportunities out there. Yes. Tim is very much a realist on the career development front, but there do seem to be a lot of opportunities out there. According to the Turku Business Region Group, some 51% of the region's exports come from manufacturing, data businesses and new technologies. So I wanted to see one of these manufacturing exporting businesses firsthand. Valmet Automotive's battery plant in Salo was a good example. They make batteries for car manufacturers all over the world, and business is currently really good. There are not many firms that can do what they do. They were producing batteries for hybrid vehicles when I was there, and just chatting with people on the production line, it was clear that the plant is a pretty international place. Here's Matthew Congleton, the production director at the Salo plant. We have a number of people that work in our facility with bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, even PhDs that work as operators when they first come in. And we don't notice this because, of course, when they come in, it's very quick. We need to, you know, people very fast sometimes, and they come in, and then, you know, we go to the floor and we start talking, and they're like, hey, you know, I have a PhD from Alto University, for example. We have a gentleman in, in logistics who is an operator. Um, and and it's been very, very great for us, to be honest, that we have kind of this, like, hidden resource pool that we've been very quick to tap Um, and so I know that for a lot of people, they think that, you know, maybe it's a bit of a difference than what they had gone to college for or to university for with these kind of liberal arts degrees or other degrees. And, of course, maybe they have high qualifications from outside of Europe or outside of Finland, and they come here thinking, you know, that it's kind of a step back. But also I would say for us, we've been very quick to kind of identify the talent that we can and, and try to promote them and give them opportunities. And I would say it's one of our kind of keys to success in a very challenging, to be honest, labor market. So I think that Finland, like most places, is kind of struggling to find labor and talent. 
And for us, this has been kind of a, a hidden resource pool that has really paid off. So as well as Matthew, I met Satish Kumar, who is originally from Bangalore. He has worked in several companies since his wife's job first took him to Finland. His credentials are formidable. Uh, academically, um, I hold a, you know, science, I'm a science graduate basically from in electronics and also hold an MBA from Metropolia. And I have three masters, in fact, uh, three master's degrees. <laughs> so uh, I also hold a master's degree in finance and management from University of Economics and from Poland. Uh, and also I have two masters from Finland itself, you know, one from Metropolia and one from Hank. So I also teach uh, uh, as a... Uh, lecturer uh, as a part-time uh, for MBA students in uh, Metropolia on corporate social responsibility apart from my day job here. So even with those qualifications, Satish had to start on the factory floor. But he worked his way up and after a couple of fairly quick promotions, he found his current role as a supply quality manager. But it has been a struggle. So I wanted to know if this company is some kind of exception or if other firms in Finland are similarly open to foreign talent. You say it's difficult to get your foot in the door. Do you think Valmet is exceptional in its attitude, or are there other companies that try and do the same thing? Um, uh, maybe all the companies are doing the same thing, but at least from the Valmet perspective, I would say, uh, as an outsider, if I had to apply for a role of a manager, maybe my resume would have not been picked up. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would have been a difficult choice. Uh, let me be honest here. Like you know, it would have been a difficult choice. You know, nobody would have even looked at your this thing. But here, I had an opportunity to prove myself. You know, that you know, I can show that and you know, I can demonstrate that. At least in that aspect, Walmart is really open. You know, if they are open to ideas, and they can see like you know what you can bring it to the table. So in that way, that opportunity is very much available. Especially as Matthew mentioned, uh, they are open to tap the hidden talents within our company. Mm. So maybe from the outside, as an outsider, if you had to apply for a, a senior role, it might be difficult you know, for somebody to pick you up mm. uh, in that aspect, I would say. Yeah, I think so. I don't have a lot of experience outside of this company. I've only worked here in Finland for Valmet Automotive. Um, but it's difficult, I think, in any industry to get a job when you just kind of are a piece of paper, right? A resume. So it's a picture and some data about you know, what you've done. Um, and I think that, you know, what you hear, at least in Finland, is that maybe it's more difficult for foreign names to get kind of the recognition. But I would say here, we don't have that kind of bias. We're so international. We're so, I mean, our working language is English. So, for example, my Finnish level is only B1, maybe A2, B1, somewhere in that range. So not communicative effectively, let's say, for work purposes. Um, and so we don't have any sort of kind of inherent biases. We're very open. When we get applications, I could speak for myself. I go through them all and just kind of look for qualifications, education, relative experiences, and we go from there. And it really has no impact, you know, where you're from or what you've done um, relative, as long as it's, you know, relative to the job, right? So I would say we're very open to, to international people. So there are options out there, even if they might not be what you're initially aiming for. Is that the takeaway from this? I think so. The labour market is changing for everyone, and especially people that move here from abroad. Nobody knows what it's going to be like when you move to a new country, and there are well-documented problems in Finland. But it was nice for me to meet some people who have found their own paths to a successful place, and hear about how things have changed a little in working life. I should stress that I met a lot of people not featured in this podcast, and I'm very thankful to all of them. And I should also mention that the government's plans for immigration rules were brought up more than once. We've heard a lot about the rule revoking employment-based residence permits three months after a person loses their job and requiring employees to inform Migri as soon as an employee leaves. That's right. Uh, these proposals are in the works, but we have covered them many times in the podcast, so the focus this week is elsewhere. I did, of course, ask Minna Arve for her view, but she declined to comment. Her party, of course, is in government, and her party colleague Arto Sattonen in the National Coalition Party is the employment minister. Now, he has a standing invitation to come on the pod for an interview, um, but he's declined to do that so far. He said maybe next year. So perhaps when he does come on the pod with his proposals for this rule, we could go back and ask Matthew Ritchie and the rest what they make of the final proposals. You can join the conversation too. We want to hear what's on your mind. 
just leave us a voice note or text on WhatsApp. Our number is plus 358-44-421-0909. It's time to see what else is making the news this week. First off, police said an accident involving a military SUV that claimed the life of a conscript was caused by a steering overcorrection. The vehicle veered off the road on Highway 6 last week. Finnish authorities say the damaged Baltic connector pipeline may be operational by next April. Finnish authorities are still probing the cause of the damage to the pipeline, with investigators focusing on a Hong Kong-flagged Chinese vessel. Finnish law enforcement raided a sanctioned Russian oligarch's island this week. The island is owned by arms manufacturer Igor Kasayev, who's suspected of having ties to the Russian security service, the FSB. Fewer than half of women in Finland say they think Finnish society is fair. That's according to a survey carried out by E2 Research. The number of lower-income families in Finland struggling to put food on the table has almost doubled to 14% since last year. That's according to the results of a survey conducted by Save the Children Finland. Nokia has filed lawsuits against Amazon and HP in several countries. The Finnish tech giant is accusing the firms of infringing a number of video streaming-related patents. An ULE survey found that one in four Finns would prefer to have a doctor from the same ethnic group. The same survey found that 35% of people would not rent out an apartment to someone from a different ethnic background. The Finnish Food Authority is dismantling an avian influenza infection zone that was established over the summer to prevent the disease from spreading. The agency said wild birds no longer pose an infection risk to poultry and other captive birds. In more animal news, the brown bears at Helsinki's Gorka Asari Zoo went into hibernation earlier than usual this year. The mother and daughter dozed off a couple of weeks earlier than usual. Hotels in Finnish Lapland say they're worried about an impending bedbug invasion, following news of infestations in other countries. Pest controllers say that although it was once rare, the insect is becoming increasingly common in Lapland. You know, Egan, we should mention that our article on bed bugs offered a Finnish solution to finishing off that pest, heating bedding materials in a sauna. Bed bugs are purported to die in temperatures exceeding 60 degrees Celsius. Well, that's a relief. Um, unless they get they get into your walls and elsewhere in your house, and then they're impossible to get rid of. But I, I mean, I suppose as temperatures keep dropping, like the the, the freezing temperatures will will also help in Finland. Um, I, I have heard the the process takes several days for that. Though. I hope we don't find out. I I'm fingers crossed on that front. Would you like a weekly summary of the top stories from Finland sent straight to your inbox? Just sign up for our weekly newsletter. Go to yle.fi slash news and look for the newsletter tab at the top of the page. That's yle.fi slash news. A few weeks ago, we followed up on a story about students who moved from Kenya to Tampere to study physiotherapy. It turned out that everything was not quite as it seemed. Ultimately, the students ended up on the hook for their fees, even though they shouldn't have because the program was a so-called education export project. That means an organization should have footed the bill, but they didn't. It was advertised all, all, all over our county. All over was in Gishu County. There were posters. There were all over the social media. You just open Facebook and you'll see the posters that there is, there is a, a sponsorship to Finland. The way it was marketed was that when you just learn in Finland, you get a job. And the job is for able to, to pay every expense that you have and the school fees. That was guaranteed. My sister is working as a teacher in Kenya. And I convinced her that she can take the loan, then I can pay it back. Uh, she finally accepted. She took the loan and used everything on this, on, the, on my journey to Finland. Our listener, Corey, got in touch about this story. He said it rekindled memories of his student days a decade ago in Uvascula. He said that like the Kenyan students we profiled, he also took cleaning jobs before and after classes to help make ends meet. 
He said that finances were a challenge even when he didn't have to pay for tuition, which the Kenya students are doing. He also told us that he ultimately went into the IT sector in Finland to gain stable employment after many years of temporary jobs. Changing careers seems like a bit of a theme in this show and among our audience. Um, If you have similar experiences or just have some feedback on the show, do let us know. Get in touch via WhatsApp, where our number is plus 358-44-421-09-09. It's the weekend, Egan, and it's time for some English language culture. What do you have in mind, Zena? Do you have some high culture Norwegian playwrights knocking around somewhere? How, how did you know? Well, how about some theater? <laughs> Helsinki's Com Theater is remounting Henrik Ibsen's classic drama, A Doll's House. There's nothing like the story of a marital breakdown to brighten the weekend. I think I'll take the wife to go and see that. Indeed. Well, what's special about Com's iteration of the Norwegian classic is that it's using English surtitles. Now, surtitles are the live performance equivalent of subtitles to offer a more inclusive show for audiences who don't speak Finnish. That is an excellent idea um, to to open up culture to new audiences, a, a valuable thing. Um, but we do have a story on that on our website, so go and check that out at wiley.fi slash news. But what about the small screen? If you want to stay in, if you, you're feeling like watching something, what does Finland's premier streaming service, Ulla Arena, have to offer this weekend? Well, Egan, moving from one family drama to another... I happen to notice that the late 1980s romantic comedy Moonstruck is streaming on Ule Arena. Cher won an Oscar for a performance uh, in her role. I'd say those chilly New York scenes fit right in with this time of year. I'll definitely check that out. Um, love a bit of Cher. And don't forget you can sign up for an Ule ID at yle.fi slash ID. That gives you the chance to comment on our stories online, get personal recommendations from Ule Arena and sign up for our weekly newsletter. But now it looks like we've come to the end of another show. For now, I'll just say a very big thank you to you, the All Points North audience, for listening to and supporting us. I'd also like to give a big thanks to our audio engineer, Pano Vilman. We'll be back next week. Bye. Bye.